Okay, so in this video, I am going to go over the top three topics that most interest you. I'm going to answer every question that you have within a half hour um, and, or until I run out of questions or I run out of time. Uh, I do that to make myself more efficient. What I mean by that is, so I'll do this to my students as well. And yes, I am a realist professor, and yes, I do have real students. Um, people say that all the time, like, well, are you are even a real professor? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a surprise. What I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, you have only write two pages, but I do want to see 20 references in those two pages, and that makes them write very tightly. That's what I'm going to try to do here. I'm, I'm limiting myself to one half hour from now. Okay, so let's get started. I put this out on my community tab. I said, uh, please list the top three topics that most interest you about the war in Ukraine. Number them with one being the most interesting, then ask any questions that you have about them. So I got 60 something responses. Uh, I will skip any responses that are duplicative, but I will try to answer everything I can. Number one, history. When you talk about items, I find it fascinating when you bring in the history of the topic area. For example, if you talk about Putin, his evolution, and some touch points of what he talks about. For instance, as far back as 2008, Putin has said that Ukraine is not even a country. Or in 2000, when Putin floated the possibility of becoming part of NATO or Putin's relationship with Yeltsin and how it influenced his decision. Example, if you talk about Prigozhin, then the fact that he started out as a hot dog vendor and you spent time in prison as Putin's chef. How did you, uh, how did the relationship with Putin last for 20 years when Prigozhin met Utkin and how did Wagner get created? Example, if you're talking about Zelensky. Okay, so that's what she's saying. This is what I find most interesting. And I try to do that a lot. What I am trying to do for you is provide context about what's going on. Not just this drone hit that, but here's how drones have evolved over time. And this is what they've done. Or um, this is what they just got an Australian cardboard drone or, or just trying to bring those kind of things in. Number two, most interesting, I love propaganda. I love how you take apart the propaganda, but I wish you gave us a list of different things that are wrong and why. Like when you're dealing with uh, Solyov uh, saying that war with Ukraine would be, quote, the worst crime you could think of. Or how they use a fire hood of falsehoods propaganda. Oh, good, Bob. A plus for um, mentioning the fire hood of falsehoods propaganda model. A list of themes, messages, falsehoods, and how they have thousands of bots with reminders that people like Ryan Macbeth go through and analyze how the propaganda is false by using military standard. I like the idea of using a reliability multiplier that you talked about recently, where you uh, take a source and multiply it by a factor to get truth or trustworthiness indicator. This is the same as idea worth, implementation effort, cost, bad idea that you put money and you lose money, great idea that you don't put much effort into, uh, does not get you any profit. Okay, so propaganda. I do spend a lot of time trying to take apart the propaganda, and that's because there is an information war and you're part of it. Like, this is my place in the line. I'm not spending time uh, on the front lines. I, there's, I have no connection there, but if I can offer something that I understand, it is trying to help you, help inform you and help you see what's actually happening. That's what I'm trying to do. Number three, teach me one of the things I was always told for any paper that I hand in is that I need to give references for my sources. You used to allow me to see the sources in the earlier videos. I have places like Warthog Defense and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we go through there. Uh, and plus over 300 channels that I've evaluated that I do not have time to go to every day. Some I find lacking or are clickbait. I also have over 100 Twitter accounts that I scan for information. That's hardcore. Then I also have a map of cool, a list of cool sites like this. Uh, when you talk about looking to see what they're trying to spread, you sometimes talk about why they're spreading it, but most of the time you forget to do this. No checklist. Uh, no, it's not forget. I'm just so I've shifted in my very early videos. I tried to show you every source about everything, and it it got very little traction because I was kind of nerding out a little bit in, in doing what I would naturally do. And so I've tried to, 
popularize isn't the right term, but I go to a, a way of explaining things where I'm showing you stuff and explaining stuff, but I'm not really trying to hear in this source, it's that, in that source, it's this, but I, I'm still showing you where the sources come from and that kind of thing. Um, all right, so, and these are the kinds of things that I am very much trying to do. I'm trying to integrate history so that you have context. I'm trying to upend the propaganda so that you can upend it and speak to those that are your friends and family who might be on the edge. Like there are some people that you're going to know that are too far gone that are just going to be repeaters. But if they're sincerely questioning, you can probably bring them back over to the right side if you understand what what they don't understand about this. And then I'm trying to teach these kinds of things. And this is a, this is a really good list of uh, people. I, I watch pretty much all of these uh, on a regular basis or, or listen to or, or read on a regular basis. Okay. Um, next, here's the first question. This was just a list of uh, what are the things that you want? Now, most of these have that and question. So what happened to Lend Lease? Why do you never hear about it anymore? Was any equipment ever received under this agreement? I can't answer the third part. The first part is this though. Lend Lease is like this fallback position. Like if if every if worse came to worst, you could still get the material, but it would be through lend lease as opposed to uh, having this um, given by a act of Congress. It's it's an act of Congress underlying. We can ask for we can requisition this that and the other thing too. So that's just a rough cut of how it works. It's still there, but it's it's more of a fallback position if that makes sense drones the future forget 3d printable guns online printable plans for cardboard drones have enormous potential yes so I, I i speak about drones a lot um i just have an interest in drones as well uh, my sons have done uh some drone training in civil air patrol and i've done the, I've, I've done a little bit with them um so i find it really interesting but it is a budding technology that is like somebody was chastising me in the comments you know we've had drones from before this war that's right but they weren't used to this scale um before this war they were used in a different capacity and i think the wave of the future is going to be not not this war necessarily but the war that follows this is going to be so heavily drone based it will look nothing like uh the the gulf war or iraq or anything anything that preceded it um in the same way that tanks are now ubiquitous okay seeing the number of losses for uh, russia from ukraine sources what percentage uh what percentage of filter should be used since ukraine will want to inflate the number 80 percent okay that's a question should we filter it to 80 percent i don't know so that so what i tend to toward like you'll see a difference in some of the way that ua tubers act and process things like jake bro just takes the number from ukraine and that's a plausible way of doing this I don't do that. I try to be as conservative as possible. And this is no slam on Jake. This is just, he's just taking the numbers and, and operating from that data. Uh, I try to be as conservative as possible. And I rely on a triangulation method of those reliable sources that I find most reliable, recognizing that while Ukraine, there's two things happening simultaneously. Ukraine has the... Um, uh what's the word i'm looking for ukraine has the motivation to inflate it and i would understand why they might have a motivation to inflate those numbers but they also have the best data so maybe they're actually most accurate i i don't know that so i'm just going to rely on us and british sources and others that i can triangulate on so i don't discount ukraine i just look to other sources so when the us says it's a it's at least this or roughly that I'll, I'll i'll stick to that and see what the uk says which is generally a little bit more than the us the us tends to be a little bit more conservative what measures are in place for ukraine and its allies to get the truth to the russian population not a lot 
uh, I would think that there would be lots of ways to do that. Well, kind of, but kind of not, right? So uh, during Soviet times, you had Radio Free Europe broadcasting into uh, Western or into Eastern Europe as much as possible to kind of have an impact on that. Um, the internet is largely controlled in Russia, where you now they can circumvent it, and I understand that a lot of one of the big sellers in the early days of the war were VPNs, so that people could get Western press. But you gotta also understand that they're they know that they're taking a risk when they're when they're getting on a VPN, and um, yeah, that, so they don't want to do that. Look, I read an account yesterday that a man um, got fined. I think it was thirty thousand rubles for wearing yellow and blue. I mean, it was like it's like you were wearing the gang colors. I mean, it was that kind of thing. Like this is, it's bizarre. It's it's being locked down. The Soviet Union or Soviet Union, Russia has Sovietized or re-Sovietized to a large degree. Not fully, not to the degree that the Soviet Union was. But if there was a trajectory as of 1995 when they went different ways, Ukraine has largely went one way, and the Russians have gone another way under Putin. What measures are in place for uh, Ukrainian allies to get the truth? I, I just, it's not a lot. Um, and so if you're just um, inundated with this and you're also beat down to be apolitical, you, you get what you're getting. Like the, the, the people aren't about to rise up. Um, one of my favorite quotes is the, the, um, the system that you have is perfectly geared to give you what you're getting. Like, that means that what you see is a reflection of the conditions and the environment and the organization that is surrounding you. And that's really what it is. I don't mean that you don't have free choice. I just mean that like, it makes sense once you realize everything that's going on around you. Okay. What day this December do you think the Kremlin itself will be massively attacked from inside Russia? <laughs> well, that's interesting that you chose in December. Um, I, I don't know. I think what's happening here, Gary, is that um, uh, the Ukrainians are really feeling out air defenses and things along those lines. And when they, it, and so right now they're harassing and they're, and they're probably, I think they're surprised how successful their drones are. Like, wow, that got through? Like, <laughs> how did that get through? Um, I think we're all surprised by that. We all thought that they had better air defense and that kind of thing. But the Russians, and, and I've, I've made this point before in previous recordings, so forgive me. But the, the Russians brag about, well, we're our, our 11 time zones. Well, your 11 time zones mean you're a big target. And the Ukrainians can pick any target that they want within there. Now, they're, they're only going to pick, generally speaking, military planes or, or air base or a uh, stockpile or a factory or something along those lines. So, I mean, they're, they're limited, but the Russians have no sense of defending these things, like what happened in Tsov. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that. And I, I, I called it Peskov the other day because I didn't know any better. This is new to me. Um, and I, I'm not Russian. I'm not even Ukrainian. I don't pronounce these things necessarily very well. But I do read. And when you, unfortunately, when you read something as opposed to uh, hear it, you sometimes mispronounce it. Pskov, uh, up by the Estonian border. Like, if you had, and, and so so that's the fascinating thing. So we we saw that happen on the Pskov Air Base, and then uh, Solyov was talking about how, well, we're ready for a war with uh, NATO. No, you're not. If you did, you would have had all kind. You would have massive defenses around Pskov. Okay. Anyway, um, so what what day in December do I think that the Kremlin will be massively attacked from inside Russia? Man, I can't tell you that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just know that uh, they're working at um, improving, iterating. Uh, iterating means you do it again and again and again until you get better and better. Uh, it's like how you learn to write your letters, right? You, you wrote it like terribly when you first did it, and now you write it pretty decently because you've practiced over time. It's that kind of thing. And... Um, the Ukrainians just keep getting better. And I got to give them such props for innovation. They're, they're just doing so well innovating. Okay, I got to keep moving. What is Trump's stance on the war? Uh, it's not good. It's not, it, it's a very self-serving stance. And what I mean by that is, and so Trump's position is America first, which is 
which is partly isolationist. Um, but it's, it's not really America first is America only. And that's there's a difference there. Like, I, I would say my position would be America first, not politically, but in the way that I think about it. Like, how does this affect us and our citizens? And, and right. And then we're thinking about the wider. But he's not thinking about the wider world. Um, and he's thinking how this will serve him. Well, I can go make a deal. Well, you're giving away part of their country. What about the people that are lost to the to the invaders or being and will never get justice or will never get their children back or what? like it, it, it's not even factoring in his mind. Vivek um, Ramaswamy is in that same kind of place, and I, I have to reject that. That doesn't that does not fit. That's not okay. Um, so what is Trump's stance on the war? It's it's pretty bad, and I don't think it's reasonable. But again, he sees himself as this deal maker. I can I can bring this peace. I can do whatever. I'm not sure. He's got a lot of um, uh, points for having been a, a deal maker in the past. Like you know, handling Kim Kim Jong Un is one thing. Handling Putin might be a very different thing. Uh, when Ukraine takes Melitopol. Um, I, I don't know when a Ukraine will take Melitopol. I, I, I just don't know like the timetable, but they're they're moving and they're they're making progress and that progress is really important. Um, when the Kerch bridge is demolished, I don't know that when the Kerch bridge will be destroyed, demolished, uh, incapacitated, whatever it is. I do I do believe and if I was a betting man, I would place money on it that it will be. Um, now, I don't know about the Molish, but maybe incapacitated, not, not usable, not passable is what I'm talking about. I, I don't know that it'll be just totally down, but they, they will do that. I mean, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. Okay, will Ukraine be forced to cede territory or what are the chances Ukraine will liberate all its land? So if you listen to political pundits, you'll you'll hear that it's most likely that they'll have to cede territory. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. It depends on what happens on the ground, uh, what progress they make, um, how. Uh, it, there's a lot of factors, but the, those that want to just conclude peace. Now remember, and I think this analogy is really useful, and I'm going to repeat it because not everybody's listened to every one of my videos, which is unfortunate, but that's the way that it is. No, I'm just kidding about the unfortunate. I mean, I, I really am trying to teach some things, and so if you miss something here or there, um, Russia is like a sole proprietorship, right? Like Putin owns all the choices that he makes. Ukraine is like a uh, corporation where while Zelensky is in charge, he has to answer to shareholders, the the, the partners um, that are supplying him with stuff. And if the partners decide that they're not, they're going to turn off the supply, Zelensky will have to make very different choices. And so, and Tucker Carlson understands this. He's saying the U.S. should just turn off the supply, and then Zelensky will be forced to have to make peace. I, I don't know that it's quite that easy because I think Zelensky would fight for a much longer time even without the, the necessary required stuff and it would just be very uh, painful. Um, but nonetheless, uh, because you work in a different context as a shareholder, you have to prove that you're having some success to the shareholders. Like that's that's what they need to do. And so will they be forced to cede territory? It depends on their, their level of success. What are the chances Ukraine will liberate all its land? Militarily, if they're successful, they could potentially do that. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm very unworried. I was going to say I'm not worried. Um, it's not exactly the right way of saying it. And unworried is a weird way of saying it. But I'm very unworried about a nuclear threat. I hear all the nuclear saber rattling only from the Russian side. I don't see it from the Ukrainian side. Um, I, I don't see that they're going to, uh, that, that Russia can use it. I've given this analogy before as well. It Having a nuclear weapon doesn't make you a conventional fighter. What I mean by that is if, if okay, so you have a grenade, right? Or some kind of high power explosive kind of thing. And you're like, Man, you can't touch me because I have a grenade. That doesn't mean you can't still get mugged. So if you're, let's say you're in the middle of a bar and or a restaurant or some crowded space and uh, there's, there's, you know, some, somebody's fighting with you, you, you have a grenade. 
can you use the grenade? Can you pull the pin and pop it in front of them? Or can you, I mean, like all these people around you, can you really use it? Or do you just have to fight with your fists? No, you're going to have to fight with your fists. You have to. So Putin has to fight conventionally here. He can't really use it. The only re use of that nuclear weapon is if he's being overrun in Moscow. Like, I mean, really seriously overrun. I don't mean hit with drones here or there. I mean, seriously overrun. And that's a very different picture. You just can't use it. America has nuclear weapons. They couldn't use it in Afghanistan or Iraq. And so that's where Putin is. And so he thinks he's tougher than he really is. Like he's, he's acting like he's um, nuclear weapon tough when he's really only conventional weapon kind of weak. And the, it's not the same thing. So at any rate, um, I'm not, I kind of wandered from your actual question of force to see territory. I, I really just I don't know based on the, uh, the variables that we have right here. It could change or it could be the same. Okay. Will military aid increase or decrease with time? I think it'll be a, a somewhat of a curve. It, it'll be a curve, a linear relationship between uh, that's nerding out. It, it'll it go up and then it'll cease over time. So um, it, it will continue to increase for a while. And at a certain point of exhaustion, you'll see it decrease but I don't think that we need to worry about that just yet. I think that um, you need to worry about that after, after you have some time, let's say year or years of parity or superiority, and you don't see any change, it will decrease and the Western partners would lose uh, confidence and, and influence and backing. Um, I, I think that's how that would happen, but I, I don't know that that will 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 actually take place how long can putin regime possibly keep on going like this let's face it things are getting worse for russia yeah that, that's a really good question um so the the answer there is they have no will to stop and they'll go as long as they can and they're only using um the budgets expanding to eight percent of gdp and they can they can go further and take more pain but i think in my heart of hearts, I think it'll be a combination of not just military efforts on the ground. It's it's really going to be the economic conditions within Russia that caused the military efforts to fail um, that will win the war. That That's what I perceive, and I could be completely wrong, but that, that's what I perceive. So... Um, and I don't think they're on the edge of collapse or anything yet. But if you look at the history of Russia, war has war and economy have been tied together, and there's been a significant impact of one on the other. And um, uh, part of it is their their economic system, as I look at it, is not okay. In the United States, it's a there's a fairly robust engine of an economy that's working and producing and creating and adding value russia is heavily dependent on the gas station model like they're you know john mccain famously said that they're a gas station um masquerading as as an as a country and that's a paraphrase but that's basically what he said if if they could cut off the oil supply and India is buying it because India is going, hey, I'm taking all the cheap oil that I can get. I don't care from who. We're apolitical. And India kind of likes Russia. I mean, if you, I just saw a poll the other day that India had a high majority of favorable um, uh, position toward Putin. I like, <laughs> it's one of the few countries that's like that. Um, if, but if you could cut off the oil supply at the source, and this would be very, very difficult, but if you could get missiles or drones or something to impact their oil supplies, if you could do something like that, that would be that would be more devastating than blowing up planes um, because it will have such a detrimental downstream effect on their ability to function because they're they're dependent on right now what they're trying to do is reroute all their oil supplies and gas to the BRIC countries. They're trying to really hard to geopolitically reorient themselves from supplying to Western Europe, which was very easy from where the oil and gas was, to 
you know, South America, uh, Africa, Asia, that kind of thing. They're trying to, you know, get away from where it was going to another place. So, and uh, yeah, I, I just think that that's really the, 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 if you can attack like the, the ball bearing, bearing plant kind of analogy in World War II, where you attack the ball bearings and then the Nazis have a hard time building things because everything needs ball bearings. The ball bearing equivalent here for Russia is oil in, in my estimation. Um, okay, uh, so next question. Uh, Russian perspective of what we can expect from the Russians. That's the first thing that you want. Uh, and that's that's one of the things I try to, to, to highlight. is like, why are they saying this in RT or in Pravda or TAS or what? Why, why are they trying to say that this is the case, not that? They're, there's a reason. They're, they're motivated. Uh, balance of power Th is this a topic for all politicians of, of today yeah absolutely and and there is a balance of power kind of um, uh, effect going on in the world right now with Russia and then propaganda on both sides and how to recognize it I, I spend a lot of time on these kind of things keep up the good work love your channel thank you user le one hx 7 dn one m that's quite a name okay William Cash says, I only have one question. Where are the promised GLSDBs? Um, I don't know. I do know that it's taking a while and uh, it, it's, it feels like whenever something's promised and it should be on its way, it takes forever to get there. Next, um, so, and part of the reason is that it, it, the wheels of justice here are going to grind slowly to begin with, but Putin has done a really good job deterring the West. And, and I really mean that. He has really deterred the West from um, doing a lot of things that it other, they otherwise might have done. Okay, next. Where are the nukes? And honestly, who knows their status? Also, if Vladov says go, are his cronies really willing to perish and carry out all his madness? I, I don't think that he... I think he knows that he can't use them. Um, but he's acting as if he's big and bad and tough as if, you know, he's some mega superhero kind of something. And it's not, it's not going to work. I don't think that he plans to use them. I think he's been, uh, getting what he wants by bluffing. Now there's something really interesting about that. If you, as long as you have a threat, it's the threat is more powerful than actually using it. Once you actually use it, you can't use that as a threat anymore. So, um, when the Kirches hit, for example, and they say, well, we're going to retaliate with something significant if this happens again. Well, yeah, like what? I mean, what are you going to do to Ukraine that you haven't done before? Like send a, an extra missile with the 20 missiles that you send to try to hit Kiev? I mean, it, I, don't, I don't understand the threat. So nukes have to be reserved as that final threat. Otherwise, if they're used, well, if they're used, it's all bad. It's a whole different ball game. But, but as long as the threat's there, it's potent. Once, once some, once the threat becomes reality, it's not as threatening as it was before. If that makes sense. Okay. Have you seen the Times Radio report about Vladimir Putin talking to kids and saying Russia will spend 1.9 trillion rubles on the Ukraine annex territories over the next two years? I didn't see that particular report, but he's been saying that for some time that they're going to rebuild Donbass and and these newly acquired Russian territories. Now the logic of this is I find really interesting. They say that they're swiping these areas, these five oblasts, in order to have a buffer zone, but then they. They immediately call it Russia and so now they need a new buffer zone on beyond Russia and more of Ukraine I mean that's that's really the logical consequence of this is that they're still right up on the border of NATO if they let's say they were to keep those five territories so I <laughs> at any rate but they have said that they were going to rebuild um, in in those areas and we'll see how much they re actually do rebuild why isn't Western media reporting that Russian state-sponsored actors are still kidnapping Ukrainian children? That's a great question. And and that's that's one that I would like to hear Tucker respond to. I, I'd really like to hear his answer about how these are... Like, to get him in front of parents of stolen children who have been kidnapped and taken away to Russia. And just to see the enormity of that. Um, I, I think that this is, this is atrocious... 
uh, you see it in like Kharkiv uh, Human Rights Council, um, those kind of blogs, but or articles or newsletters or whatever. But you don't see it in most like mainstream. Like I've seen stuff by the BBC or Guardian or um, Radio for Europe, but it's it's few and far between. But it it needs to be more prominent. I agree. What are my thoughts on the Victor Orban Tucker Carlson interview? Honestly. I fell asleep while I was watching it. I mean, there was the last thing I was doing just last night and I fell asleep while I was watching it. I'm surprised it didn't like screw up my dreams or something. Um, but it's nothing new. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that uh, Tucker and Orban had always talked about before. The, the trick is that Orban looks like somewhat conservative and it resonates somewhat conservatively until you dig deeper and realize that the roots of it are authoritarian. And I know some of you are going to say, well, all conservatism is authoritarian. No, it's not. Conservatism is um, based on what you're conserving. And if you're conserving something authoritarianism, uh, authoritarian, that's a not so good kind of conservative. And you're, if you're conserving something that is going back, like, so the American founding fathers, when they were fighting England, they were conservative in the sense of they were conserving the rights and freedoms of Englishmen that they had been guaranteed in the charters. And that's what they were fighting for. That was conservative of a good thing. So, so it's it's a very different picture of what Orban is as opposed to um, what he, he kind of looks like at first blush, and you've got to make a distinction. I, I'm not a, a big fan of Orban. I think he uh, is is in the in Putin's pockets or is beholden to him. He wants the cheap oil and and stuff from uh, gas from uh, from Russia and. Um, yeah, yeah, he's in a very uncomfortable position as well because he has these inclinations or leanings toward Russia. Uh, so that's that's where we are. Okay, I promised you that I would go only about a half hour here, and so I'm going to be good to my word and end it there, even though I have a lot more to go. But this is these were a lot of really good questions. I just had to unpack some things in order to explain them well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes. Come, please come back tomorrow. Please subscribe and hit that like button and come back And because I'm trying to help you understand the context of what's going on in Ukraine. And if that's what you're interested in, this is the right place. Thank you. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.